instability, geopolitics, which was not something we were expecting to, to talk about necessarily. Um, but I suppose, uh, how are you seeing that in terms of, of impact? Because there's plainly going to be some impact on supply chains and those kinds of things. But um, I suppose, is that making a, a significant impact, do you think, on the, on the logistics sector broadly? Yeah, well, of course, we have to look at the starting point, and the starting point is very healthy. So the structural positive development for logistics remains unchanged, no matter uh, what is currently happening. Of course, what is currently happening in the Ukraine, other than it's a, uh, from a humanitarian aspect, it's a terrible situation, we only see very limited impact on our business. So we have done a query among our, uh, um, among our clients who would be impacted how much, and it's very, very limited. And uh, both Ukraine and Russia are of limited relevance for the logistics uh, market as such. So the, the economic connections to the two countries are limited. It's not one of the, these are not key countries. So we currently see the direct impact very limited. Of course, there will be some indirect, it will have an impact on inflation and subsequent effects, but directly it's very limited. Okay, and is that the same for, I mean, is it, is it leading to anybody stepping back a little bit from, for example, the CE region, um, or, you know, largely do you see that unaffected in terms of, the, you know, your sector? And we all agree on the humanitarian side, obviously. Yeah, I, mean, I think from, a, again, not speaking necessarily um, from the standpoint of Heinz, but I think there is a perception within the institutional investment community that, if you are going to invest in CE, better to wait a week or two and see. The situation has been so dynamic, both from a humanitarian aspect as well as from, a, from the overall um, strategic aspect of what's going to happen. I think it's led to a little bit of short-term uncertainty. Um, however, I, I, I do agree with Frank. I think that, the, um, that, that maybe there's an, over, um, an overemphasis or, or, or too much focus on sort of the negative of this. I think you know, that you... At least in terms of some of the some of the other uh, countries in Central Europe currently having one to two million plus refugees coming in, I think will will really create a lot of longer term impacts and potentially even demand um, for logistics than you see currently. And I think we're really just at the very first stages of understanding what some of these longer term impacts are. So, you know, we're we're as an organization, we're here to help. We're focused on it very carefully, um, and we're going to do everything we can. Um, and, uh, and Rob, just just from your perspective, I suppose, um, you know, we were already seeing a lot of focus on, you know, post-pandemic because of the issues with supply chains, a, a bigger focus on nearshoring. We've then had, obviously, the European Union talking then about much more, you know, having a much more resilient supply chain um, you know, onshoring more manufacturing, less focus on the globalization in a way and rolling back some of that. Um, uh, what does that actually mean, do you think, in terms of um, in terms of the logistics space? Does it mean more? Does it mean less? Does it mean um, the same but just slightly different com different configuration? What, what's your kind of best view on it, really? Um, uh, more, I think, uh, uh, undoubtedly. I mean, yes, COVID was the start of really focusing on that area, but uh, the Ukraine war has, I think, you know, escalated that even more. It's very clear, if you look at some of these car car manufacturers at the moment, struggling because they can't get hold of the, what they need to make their cars. You know, there's going to be a number of these manufacturers that are going to, going to have to look at their supply chain even carefully. Um, so undoubtedly, it's going to be more demand. Um, and, you know, we just need to see how we can solve that um, as an industry, because you know, there's, there's just not enough product out there to, to, to satisfy that. Okay, good. Um, and Daniel, relative newcomer, not to the world of real estate, but to the world, <laughs> but to the world of logistics, um, certainly from, from Kane International's position. Um, I, I suppose, what were the drivers for you um, for that and, and, and the timing now? Um, so we've sort of made our first entrance in um, with a large portfolio in the UK. And for us, it's just, you know, driven by the fundamentals of the megatrends, right? You know, retail is changing, logistics is changing, the way people are shopping is changing, the way supply chains are, cha are emerging is changing. I think all that feeds into a shift and a greater demand, as everyone's saying, for logistics. And I think what's gone on over the last couple of years and then what's, what's going on now only exacerbates that point. I think, 
you know, the whole issue of onshoring is not just a logistics issue, right? You know, in terms of, you know, what, 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 what industrial units you need. You know, you know, you go back to the sort of onshoring to a completely different way. The US was, was the world's biggest importer of oil. It's now an exporter of oil, you know? And I think the idea that we have supply chains to have, that the globalization has gone to such an extent over the last 15, 20 years. And I think the major, major Western economies are turning their back on some of that and need to know that they have their supply chains with reliable partners. And unfortunately, some of the world's resources are with le less reliable partners. And I think that's creating a change. And I think you're seeing that across, you know, across all the sectors, not, you know, and that's feeding through into demand for logistics. Um, and let's pick up on that demand side, Frank, as well. Um, I mean, are you in general seeing increasing demand for space? And are you with uh, with Rob on that in a way that, that, that this is actually going to just increase demand for space? Yeah, we, we do see the resilience of the supply chain as one driver, as you, as you said. And of course, the other driver is um, the continuous growth of e-commerce. So those are the two elements which drive demand and will increase demand. Of course, when we talk about globalization, globalization used to be a big driver of, of, uh, of warehouse, demand for warehouses. If this is turned back, if there is a more general economic setback, it will have a negative impact. But our assumption still is that there will be reasonable growth going forward for the economy as a whole, and that in combination with the two main drivers for the demand for, uh, for warehouse space, will drive up warehouse uh, demand structurally, and this is why we are optimistic in principle. And then, of course, there's a difference between several markets, because some markets are very strong and on the demand side, with heavy restrictions on the supply side, whereas others are relatively strong on the demand side and much less restrictions on the supply side. And just in general, um, and anybody can pick this up, I mean, we're likely to have, you know, at least an economic downturn, let's say. Um, there used to be a connection between economic downturn and requirement for logistics space and warehousing, which seems to no longer have that same connection. So is, is uh, I suppose, is the logistics sector also going to be resilient against a downturn in, in economies in, 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 in Europe? Uh, you want to go? I, I'm happy to go. I mean... I, to, a, to an extent, I mean, obviously, consumer spending, it's, if, if that drops, then there's demand for the e-commerce will drop. But fundamentally, I think there, it is going to be very resilient. Um, there is still going to be, if you look at the pent-up demand through, through all sectors and the lack of supply, I think that that will mean that even with a downturn, I still think it's very resilient. Okay, good. Yep, go ahead. Well, I wouldn't say it's not immune against, uh, against economic downturn, but compared to other sectors, on a relative basis, it's more resilient. Yeah? Um, and so we're struggling to find challenges for it <laughs> at the moment. So what are those challenges? I would, have, I <laughs> yeah. would disagree to that. <laughs> okay, good. Well, then let's see what those challenges are. So, so what are the challenges? Let's start with you, Frank. I mean, what are the key challenges that, that you're facing at the moment? So, so first of all, I think reputation on the demand side and increase in rents is, 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 well, it is strong, but probably not as strong as the general perception is. Yeah? So, so it's not that as a landlord you can set the rent as whatever you want to. There is competition. And again, in some countries, in, in particular in Central Europe, or take Poland, for example, there is hefty competition for for clients. Yeah? So there is something on the demand side. And, and then, of course, there's a lot on the supply side. We have restrictions on finding land. We, are, we have restrictions on getting land zoned and, and building permits approved to, to deliver. We have construction prices, which are increasing dramatically. And, and uh, the, the current formula between land price, construction prices, and current rents does not work. Uh, anymore, you know, so it, there need, and there, it requires an impact on the, well, mainly on the rental side to make it work again. So there are lots of challenges as well. So it's not the paradise as, as many newcomers think when they price assets. Um, and uh, it, just in terms of that, that pricing side, and maybe coming to you, Logan, on that, um, you know, we've seen yields getting lower and lower and lower. Um, where are we? Is that starting to become a challenge from an investment perspective? Well, you know, this is, this is really the question, I think, of the, of the day. 
for logistics, right? And if we'd had this conversation five years ago, the age-old story was, hey, logistics and industrial should always trade at a discount, say 200 basis points more than office and retail because it's easier to build, it's cheaper, it's you know, more e easier for tenants to just pick up and leave, et cetera. You know, that's changed. Now, in many cases, it's trading at a premium. And the question is, why should it go down below? But the, the, the question really comes back to a point Frank was making. It comes back to the, to, to the level of expected market rental growth within the sector. And also, if we'd had this conversation five years ago, nobody in this room or this conference probably would have predicted the level of rental growth that we've already seen in some markets. I'm not just talking about Europe here. You look at core markets in the U.S., such as Southern California or the New York area, you've seen comfortably double-digit rental growth there last year, you know, 20, 30 percent in some cases. There are markets within Europe where you have seen 20 percent rental growth last year. Now we can talk about the reasons why, um, you know, such as, such as onshoring, such as COVID, e-commerce, et cetera. But I think the, the question is, and the reason why you're seeing yields where they are is everyone is saying, we, you know, we go to investment committee five years ago, right? And the big debate would be, should market rental growth be 1.5% or 2.5%? And that was kind of the range we would discuss. That's complete, that was wrong, right? And I think that, that now the numbers are discussed are much higher, legitimately. And not, that it, not that it's roses and sunshine in all markets, not that it will continue up forever, but the reality of it is there are some real structural drivers that are creating market rental growth, and we've touched on a few. Um, you know, e-commerce, far and away the biggest one. Even, even before COVID, all of this was already happening. Reshoring was just starting to happen. COVID accelerated it, and now we're seeing the political situation in Europe accelerate it further. Construction costs. Construction costs have increased by, on average, let's say 10 to 15 percent across Europe last year. Um, longer planning times. There's much more consideration and thoughtfulness about, wait a minute, before I put a brand new warehouse on what used to be a green piece of land right here, what are the longer term implications from an ESG standpoint? Do we really want it there? And planning processes that developers had expected might take six months are now taking two, three years further. Um, so huge changes. And if you add all of that up, it really does create a scenario whereby we might continue to see expected rental growth. And by the way, the last one, I guess, is inflation. Remember, I mean, usually the reason we would assume, again, across the real estate industry, 1% to 2% market rental growth was that number was roughly in line with inflation. A year ago, nobody in this room would have predicted that we'd be in a 7% inflationary environment. You know, if you add all of this together, all of a sudden, it becomes a very interesting and realistic discussion of, wait a minute, maybe 7% should be our baseline expectation for market rental growth. I'm not saying that, but this is where you get to. And you can justify this in this sector probably more than some other sectors. Sometimes when you look at the underlying structural demand drivers that are leading to this. So, you know, to your question, Richard, on, on why, you know, where cap rates are going, et cetera, I think it really kind of depends. It depends on what you're buying and where. I think that there's much more diversity within logistics and industrial than people realize. It's kind of, hey, we've got cross stocks, we've got big box, and we've got the XXL sheds, and that's kind of it. But there's a thousand different types and subcategories and demand drivers and tenant users, et cetera. Um, you know, we can talk about last mile, for example, right? Last mile is a bit of a, of a, you know, a, a stand-in statement for something that's supposed to be e-commerce driven and close in. Well, if you look at how Amazon actually delivers last mile, a reasonably high proportion of it comes from very large facilities that are 30 minutes away from urban centers. You know, but that, that's last mile. That's who's going to the door. But you wouldn't think of it as kind of a classic last mile facility. You know, conversely, you look at, at some of the users of this, of what we would call last mile and some of the big kind of aggregated last mile portfolios, Look at really what they're doing in here. It'll be someone who's been in the building since 1973 repairing air conditioners or something. Like, and, and, and that's last mile, right? So you know, we, we, we don't really use a common definition within the real estate industry for what last mile is or isn't. And I think collectively, we're all heading in that direction, realizing it at, at, a, at a larger macro level that in fact, yeah, logistics and industrial real estate, it, it is in some way uh, a a critical piece of infrastructure of modern cities, right? In the same way that a, that a mobile tower would be, in the same way that, a, that an electrical grid might be. And so it's, it, there's more attention given to it from an urban 
planning standpoint, I think, than has ever been the case. Um, and so we spend a lot of time with Heinz thinking about this because it's kind of what we do. We, we really live in cities and spend a long time working with the community and developing longer term projects. So, um, so this is really top of mind for us, but it's, it's a really interesting and exciting time to be in the sector. Um, and it, 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 I, I don't see it changing anytime for the next three years. I don't see it going down. It'd be interesting to get perspectives as well on that. I mean, the city thing I think is really interesting because often, um, you know, cities are very keen to have, you know, things that are creating employment, things that are, you know, working on shopping centres, working on those. But but a logistics shed was very much viewed as the ugly baby that they didn't necessarily want. Um, so has that changed? Uh, you know, are you seeing more? I mean, let's start with you, Robert. Are you seeing more? You know, cities more welcoming in terms of that, particularly for the for the for the fact that they know that there's a requirement for last mile. I think very varied. To be honest, I think, you know, and if you talk on countries, you know, we know that certainly Germany and France are really restricting their new new requirements and for logistics. Um, they want the, the employment um, side of it. And then you look at certain places like, like the UK and it's very regional basis. You know, you'll have some some authorities that actually really want that. You know, Warrington, example, up in the northwest. You know, they've been, they've been offering land and quite easy to get that land and same as Wakefield, but then you might go to some other locations and it's just, you know, it's a nightmare. You can't get anything. So it is, it is quite micro when you go to that side of things. I mean, certainly from a country perspective, there are certain countries that basically almost said moratorium, no more. Uh, but then you go into the more micro locations where it actually you know, can be different. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to come to the ESG part in a minute, but I just wanted to pick up on um, some of the locations for people who are looking at, at, you know, where in terms of geographies might be the more interesting places. Um, so are you particularly seeing opportunities? Um, I mean, Daniel, are you looking at continuing that with more investment going forward and therefore are there more attractive countries where you're seeing more opportunity um, just in terms of the region side? Um, we're initially focused on the UK. I think um, uh, the, the attractiveness of the market in the UK all comes down to uh, s supply. Supply is so much more restricted in the UK than in you know in certain continental countries, particularly Central Europe. You know there is there is more supply, um, and you know you're seeing you're seeing stats in London now that supply is going to run out in five months. You know the issues we just talked about about you know how how hard it is to get planning, how much more challenging it is. Um, and that's and that's what you know, you've got to go back to fundamentals, right? What are yields and rents driven by? They're driven by fundamentals, right? When you've got loads of land and no supply, I mean, it's not a great market. When you've got not a lot of supply and great demand, that's the place to be. And you know, the UK generally sort of ticks those boxes for us. And look, I'm not saying other markets don't, but um, and I think it's important to have a spread. But you know, you've got the continent of Europe is far behind the UK in terms of internet penetration. So there is huge amounts of growth to happen in those in those jurisdictions, but the UK is just so restricted in terms of land, and that's what's triggering the higher rents. You know, in London now, in sort of let's call it the zone three London, you know, logistics land prices are higher than residential land prices. I mean, if you think just think about that as a, as a phenomenon, you know, it's more valuable for me to build an industrial warehouse in zone three in London than it is for me to build residential. You know, and, and some of those places want that because there's been such an overflow of residential that doesn't bring any employment. To put a logistics unit last mile that employs people is very, very attractive for some local boroughs and towns. So you're, you're seeing, I mean, uh, you know, Kane, I mean, we, Kane, a few years ago, we, we sold a site on, in, um, you know, on the water in, just along the Thames, and it was originally going to be in, uh, residential, and we sold it for industrial use. You know, we sold it, rents of those days, four years ago, with 12, 13. Couldn't believe that you get 12 or 13 year pounds for industrial. Now the rents are 30. So, you know, it does just show you that, that when you have this really, really restricted supply, it, it does make you think about what is, the, what is the most appropriate land use. And in some cases, it's industrial where you wouldn't think it would be. No, uh, I just think it's quite an interesting thing. We look at it. We look at the UK. Is that a good example of what's going to happen elsewhere in Europe? Because they, you know, they're the sort of the first movers on e-commerce, the rental growth, the supply and demand. But it is different. You know, historically, it's all been supply and demand driven rents rather than indexation. Can you capture that growth when you when you're buying into those European markets? You know, 
yields are normally historically buying those sort of three percent yields, you do want that growth to be able to hit your returns. It should happen in, in continental Europe. The rents are low relative, and they're normally a cost plus model, which and you feel like there should be more demand, there should be more pressure. So we, we really believe it will come through. But you've got to be a bit more patient, I think. You know, in UK it happens so quickly. I mean values of the last twelve months have gone up twenty five percent, you know, plus. Some, and that's just normal logistics. Some of these parties that have been taking profits out of the market recently, you know, they've made 25% on gross value over the last 12 months. Is it seen in Europe yet? Not it. But, you know, you look at the actual capital value per square meter on some of these units or things like that, there should be more growth in Europe. But it, can you capture it is the big question. Yeah, uh, well, and the, from the continental European perspective, from someone who's not present in the UK, you know, so the, the starting question is, is there a natural law which suggests that capital values in the UK should be twice or three times as high as on the continent in a country where, of course, I, I respect the shortness of land, but when you look at the density of the uh, our population is in the UK, it's not so different from continental Europe. Yeah? And when you look at the Netherlands, uh, it's the density of population is much higher. So with that logic, there should be much higher prices either in, in, in the Netherlands or lower prices in the UK. Uh, it's just for historic reasons, at least as long as I work in real estate, which is quite a few years now, it always has been the case that the UK has been much more expensive. Yeah? Although I have never embraced it completely, but we do, of course, see similar developments on the continent, especially in countries where where uh, unemployment is very low because unemployment, of course, is a driver that communities want to attract also logistics. And in countries like Germany or the Czech Republic where unemployment is low, this, the restrictions come up and, 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 and cities and, and towns are much more resistant to develop further greenfield because they, of course, they don't, and we, we, we will talk about ESG in a moment, but they don't want to consume so much fresh green land. And at the same time, there are a lot of brownfields which, which in, in central locations where they have an issue with what to do with it. And, and they want to push the developers into these fields and we have accepted it for P3. You know? So we see it rather as an opportunity than, than a threat and we are going after locations in, in, in more central brownfield locations appreciating that processes are long, uh, decontamination is an issue, construction costs or demol demolition costs are an issue, so it has an impact on the economics, but from a societal point of view, it does make sense you know, not to consume another greenfield, but rather use what you have and what you had in use already in, 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 in the cities. Um, and let's pick up on that, that's an interesting point, let's pick up on the, the ESG sustainability side. Um, because pretty much, I mean, I think if I was having this discussion two years ago, plausibly, certainly five years ago, but even two years ago, sustainability and logistics, it was not the hottest you know, topic that there was. Um, whereas now I can see that there's a lot of activity in terms of both the E side, but also actually on the kind of wellness, social side as well. Um, so maybe let's start with you, Logan, just in terms of uh, just in terms of that side of that, how much has that moved forward? Is that to do with kind of an overall view from Heinz and therefore logistics is a sector within that and so that works or is it being driven by institutional capital occupiers? Yeah, th thanks. And I think the short answer is it's being driven by everybody at, at, at this point. Um, it, clearly, ESG is on the forefront of most investors and occupiers' agendas, certainly more so than it was two years ago. Um, even outside of just logistics. I think it's a general statement you can make about the real estate industry as a whole. Um, a, a couple points, though. I think, firstly, when you look back over five years or so, I really do think for some of the reasons that Frank had, had mentioned, um, logistics developers have, have always been a little bit on the forefront of it, um, and perhaps only because, as compared to perhaps other property sectors, logistics developers were the ones who've been in the habit of meeting with towns and cities and municipalities for the past 20 years explaining to them you know, why this large piece of green land would be better suited as a warehouse. So there has been a lot of thoughtfulness early on around the environmental side, I think in particular, when you look at how, how some of the larger platform developers have managed, both in the US as well as Europe too. So, you know, and I think it's certainly more so than when I look at, at comparable office or residential or, or retail developers. Um, so I think that 
that in another aspect as well as solar has been uh, within with top, top of mind for logistics developers for comfortably five years, probably 10, um, as the technologies started to um, evolve and get more productive and more efficient, it was the logistics developers generally who were the ones explaining to the rest of the commercial industry kind of what was going on with solar. So here we are now. Um, ESG is, is in, in, you know, with, with, with Heinz, we have a great vantage point because we really do take it quite seriously at all, at all different levels. And you're right, not just the environmental side, but what does it really mean? What, what, it, what are the social implications of a warehouse, right? I mean, they're, and they're profound when you really stop and think about it. You know, wait a minute, we're going in there and we're, we're employing people. Okay, that's one thing. Well, with a lot of these modern warehouses, it wasn't, you know, the, the jobs have been changing. If you look at, the, there's, there's a graph that demonstrates the growth in warehouse employment in the U.S., and it's almost just straight up, straight through COVID. And the jobs that are being created in some of these modern warehouses are not the ones, that they're, they're fairly professional jobs. They involve many times dealing with automation and robotics and complex supply chain. They're much more highly skilled, highly educated jobs. And cities and communities have realized that, wait a minute, this is a, can be a really positive thing compared to the stereotypical warehouse worker from 10 years ago, where it was just you know, kind of a, not seen as a, as, a, as a high end job that you could grow a career and build into. So that's changing as well, is that cities and communities are really embracing this from the aspect of, of the societal standpoint. Um, and I think you know, governance in terms of the, of the G of ESG, um, there, even apart from warehouses, it seems like there's still not a lot of, of consensus around what that even really means. I mean, we, when we look at it, it's more about decision making and transparency and being able to demonstrate clearly what it is you're doing, why you're doing it um, to, your, to your occupiers, your investors, the community at large. Um, and, and we see it happening everywhere. But I think too often that, that when people talk about ESG in warehouses, they really, it really comes quickly to a decision about, okay, let's talk about solar panels, right? And yet that's an important aspect of it, right? But, you know, that's a separate conversation. And that's 5% of the discussion. It's not like you can just kind of, you know, put on some solar panels and assume that you've, you, you've, you've met your ESG requirements. It's really more the life cycle of the building itself, the materials of the building, the, the relationship with the community, um, and it's a long process, and you have to kind of be there. It's tough to just sort of build a building and say, hey, it's great. It's, it's got a certificate. We're good. Goodbye. Um, it's more about how the, what, how, the, how the building lives within the community and how the people interact with the building itself. Okay, good. Any other? I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I saw some um, research the other day which was just on the amount of power usage that there now is and the, the growth of that in terms of, logistics generally and also because of concerns around um, the number of employees and access to employees being a, a, a challenge as well for the industry which may lead to then to more automation you've then got electric vehicles coming um, so the power requirements are potentially going to go up astronomically so how does that sit also then with the the desire to be co2 neutral for example I mean I don't know whether that's a that that's presumably an issue for for everybody I think I think it's a journey. Yeah? So so first of all, it's if you take all into into consideration at the same time, it's getting so super complex that there's a risk of not getting anywhere in, in any of the dimensions. Yeah? So we look at it. Of course, S, the S and the G are very important. But when you when you really look at it into into, into the detail, our organizations are tend to be small. Yeah? So, of course, we have to take care of that. And, and then we are not the operators of the warehouse. It's, it's others. So we have to provide facilities which enable our clients to provide the S for, for, for the workforce they have on it, and which leaves us with a big E. And, and, and that's the driver for all the, the warehouses we, we create and operate. And I do think that it's very important to really cr make specific steps which have a positive impact tomorrow rather than the big statement in, in 10 years or 20 years from now, we will be carbon neutral. You know? so, and then, of course, when you, and in, in the particular environment which we have right now, and again, Ukraine and the energy prices, I mean, it's the most obvious thing that solar panels make a lot of sense. We have huge roofs which we don't use adequately. So what else than putting solar panels on it? And, and once you say so, between this and, and really implementing, it's a long way because in each country the, the regulations are different, are different. In some countries, including Germany, even within the country, 
from the, in the different states, you have different rules. You know? So to apply that in a systematic way, at least I haven't found any of the players who have completely embraced it. And we are really trying to do it right now. And it's, an, it's such an effort. Yeah? And, but this is the specific outcome which we need. And then basic things, including LED lighting, having uh, energy for electric cars on site, and all these things, they, they, look very, they sound very basic. But to implement them is, is quite an effort. And, and this is really what we have to focus on, where we have to deliver. So, uh, and that's what we focus on as P3, rather than saying, OK, uh, I commit my successor of a successor of my successor to something which is due in 2050. Well, look, look, so, it's a, so we've just bought a brand new portfolio, two completed assets, five forward fundings, all ESG compliant in all the things you talked about. Solar panels on every roof, you know, sustainable materials, electric charging points, 40% roof coverage with glass, with windows, windows above the dock doors, so that you can reduce the general lighting. So you, you can do it if you want to spend the money, and the developer makes carbon offset payments. So therefore, it's a completely carbon neutral portfolio. So the idea that people don't want to do it is not correct. People just don't want to spend the money to do it. Right? So, you know... And in a higher rental environment, you can afford to do those things. And typically, in what you're seeing now in the UK is the dominant factor in developing logistics is the land price. It's not the build costs. The build costs are going up. But the land, particularly in London, you can be looking at logistics where the land price is two-thirds, the build cost is one-third. So if you want to spend 10% more of your build cost on doing all these things, that is purely a financial decision not to do it or to do it. Because it, it, the, I, and actually, I think what you're going to see is massive obsolescence in the industry over the course of the next five years. The fact that you have a warehouse that's 10 years old, that you know, doesn't have solar panels, doesn't have enough glass, doesn't have electric charging, it's all made with non-sustainable material, will create obsolescence. And I think that will only ultimately increase demand for high ESG um, assets. And I think that's the way it's going. There's, there's no re you're seeing it. We've, we've bought a completely carbon neutral, high quality environmental portfolio. There's no reason people can't do it, except it doesn't make financial sense. And in the UK, it now does make complete financial sense to do that. It's beginning to make me think that I need to turn my house into a logistics hub <laughs> in London. <laughs> um, sorry. No, I think, I suppose it's very clear on, on new build. Obviously, yes, you've got to do what you've got to do, but the majority of the stock is not new. Um, so how, how do you deal with the older stock? Uh, I think that's the biggest challenge our industry's got because, you know, especially when you talk to some of the smaller units, you know, using these blow heaters, you know, there's no way you could ever get any of these units anywhere near carbon neutral. You know, they're going to be paying, you'd be paying carbon taxes. And also, looking forward, you're not going to be able to knock down buildings. You're going to have to deal with them. You're not, they won't allow you to probably replace it with new because you've got the embedded carbon. So that is part of the industry. I don't think we've got our, our heads around exactly what that means. But you just think of the amount of stock out there. It's not as easy to just, oh, just knock it down. I don't think that's going to be viable going forward. And is the absolence is, 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 is an ESG problem. You know? so, so it's not the solution. Because if you knock it down, then you cr it's less sustainable than if you find ways to deal with it and, and improve buildings. Are we expecting to see more kind of green financing to help support that for, for asset managers, asset owners, um, that transition? I think we are currently doing it. I mean, who's the driver of, of all this? You know? So, of course, we as companies want it. We are seeing the start of it by, by our tenants, you know? so all, although differently. So the big corporates, they, they have their own ESG strategy and are pushing for green solutions. Some of, the, some of the less sophisticated are not there yet, but we expect it to happen over time. And of course, on the financing side, investors and banks are under pressure to, to improve the green, green component. So this is why we have, for example, we have issued our first bonds in January, a billion of green bonds, and we decided for a debut to structure it as green right from the start because we expect investors in that to put much more emphasis on it and, and we wanted to participate in that. And that will be a big driver as well. Okay, good. Um, just briefly, speculative development is now back in various markets. Um, <clears throat> we saw cycles of that before, which then led to issues with rent. 
But are we in a different world now where we're not going to be caught in that little trap again? Um, and I won't have to have discussions well, later. Okay, look, I, if you're developing a warehouse in London today and it's 12 months away from delivery, you tell me one agent who will tell you to pre-lease that asset. No one will. So, yes, yeah, so I think in the correct markets, because the idea is if you pre-lease today, you're going to give away exceptional rental growth over the next 12 months. So... So you've got in the UK we have we have long leases and typically you have five mark five every five years open market rent reviews. No tenant wants to sign open market rent reviews. They all want to sign indexation. So when you look at that and you see articles coming out around the stock in London is going to run out in the next five months, you know, speculative development is very much back. <laughs> okay, uh, and yeah, but it's not just you know not just London. Obviously, it's it's right across the country, and you know we're looking at a number of projects which, yes, you want to focus on those really key hubs, uh, but you go slightly further afield, there's still the demand there. Now, okay, you know, longer term, maybe it's not always the right place to go slightly further afield, but tenants just need the, need the space. Uh, and certain tenants want more about the specification of the building and really need something right, and some need the locations. But there is a spread of tenant demand there to allow you to do that. And look, at the moment, with development, I mean, the, the spreads you're getting at the moment is at best 100 basis points from your development yield, you're stabilised. So you have to pre-lease or pretty much pre-lease, you know, ready to go. Otherwise, your numbers don't work. Um, but it's but there's so much demand out there. And is that true across Europe in, in all of the, the, the kind of main markets, let's say? I mean, is there much vacancy in anybody's portfolios or what's the situation? Yeah, it differs market from market to market, yeah. So so we tend to have a mix of, of BTSs and and speculative developments. Of course in markets like Poland, you you you, ha you do have some vacancy and a lot of potential and development pipelines. So so you probably wouldn't build hugely spec when you're in densely populated region, or when you're in Prague, or when you're in, in Germany, there, or in, in France, or Netherlands, I think uh, the risk is limited to go speculative. So we, we would always do that. It's more about finding the right opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I'd say you're seeing speculative development in more or less every market right now, every country, certainly. Um, in many cases, what we would have said four years ago are secondary markets in those countries. Um, and they tend to, to be leasing as well. And it's not like it will, you know, it will always be perfect, but you know, some markets you, you can't develop spec. You like to Germany, for example, extremely difficult to go just go build spec. You, you, you can't in the same way that you can't get a building permit, the same way that you would in the UK. Um, and, you know, and, I, and I take your point on not you know, waiting to, to, to you know, the extra nine months to maximize your, you know, your rent for your project, but I think realistically most developers would be happy to have the conversation for a project that they're working on. You know, you've got the land, you've got the building permit. If you have a prospective tenant, you're going to have that conversation. You know, at least to just understand what it is. I think, you know, 99 developers out of 100 would do it. Um, but I will say that I've heard stories from the U.S. where, in certain markets, that agents, you know, when when, when developers are going out to try to to try to pre-lease a building, agents they're actually going out on a with with no no asking rent. Right, which is uncommon. I haven't heard that before in the center, where you know you've got a whatever half a million square feet somewhere outside of Chicago, and you're going to lease it. And the agent said, well, "I'm in what what per square foot? You tell me. You're the you're the tenant." And then they get anxious, and you know this is where you get your rental growth from. And this is not something that we're accustomed to in the sector. Again, it's another anecdotal piece of evidence that does suggest that market rental growth is coming. Um, it's, it's not that functional obsolescence, you know, can't take that away over the longer term. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us as an industry to try to balance that, right? To, to acknowledge that yes, logistics, real estate is kind of important now. Uh, we are going to see market rental growth. We should benefit from it, but we should continue to build sustainable buildings and make the investments that we need to make, um, to, to kind of try to balance it and to provide that supply, you know, intelligently over the long term. So. Um, and in terms of the sector, is there, you know, in most sectors, you know, there would be a granularity which is mm, not a great office, great office, um, you know, don't buy that, do buy this. Um, is that the same for logistics or have we only got great and really great? <laughs> no, 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 I think in terms of the sort of things we talked about on the ESG in terms of, you know, you know, 
you know, roof lights and you know quality of building. Yes, you can. But you know, I remember you know, back in the day in 2003, going around France and Paris and looking at warehouses, and you go, oh, it's got six meters clear height. That's not too bad. You know, I would have preferred to have eight, right? You know, 10, 10, 10 meters was the absolute. You know, that was the that was the best that you had. You know, if you had ten meters, perfect, right? Now you're talking about twelve and fourteen as averages, and you know, in one of the portfolio we bought, it's a big warehouse, six hundred and fifty-five thousand square feet. It's got floor to ceiling of eighteen meters. You know, that didn't exist before. So, in terms of you know, when you when you're looking at some of these units where you're building buildings of, call it 5,000, 8,000 square meters in a, in, a, in a park, and you've got 14 meters clear height, just think what a tenant can do with that space that it can't do with a building that's got 10 meters. They have to take more space when it's 10 meters. So you are, so there is an ability to have better quality buildings. Now, you're not going to go much above 18 because it just becomes uneconomical in terms of racking. But, you know, for an average unit now to be 12 to 14, really probably 14, you know, that is a complete change in spec to where it used to be. You know, who was going to... No one's going to look at a building that's six square metres. Sorry, so six metres. Okay. I don't agree. I mean, I think that there's, there's a, an older generation of buildings that... You know, and it comes down to price at some point. I mean, there's plenty of, you know, pick any market. I mean, go within the M25. There's plenty of buildings built in 1950s, 60s that are still perfectly functional for their users. They've got the asbestos roofs. They're completely non-compliant from an ESG standpoint. For sure, they need more, more CapEx. For sure, there's a thousand upgrades you could do. But they're absolutely essential to the tenant's business. I mean, for the larger new build, I, I, I do agree with yeah. you. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to price and the discussion we had before about what you really think rental growth is going to be. I mean, and, and, and it's these older buildings, the example, the, one, the ones within the M25, where you really have seen more rental growth than anywhere else in the UK. I mean, if we've seen a lot in the Midlands, you've seen twice that within the M25 for some of these really, really old buildings. So, you know, it's very difficult to say, and ultimately, you know, clear height is, is an important aspect for sure, but it's one of 20 aspects that will, important aspects that will influence how functional a building is for its particular user or potential future users. And balancing all of that is key to, to understanding what a good investment is. Knowing just how much of a truck court you can get away with. Okay, what type of turning radius do they have? Okay, yes, I know the floor is, is, uh, it is, is less than one ton, but from the type of operations that are likely to happen in this building, it's never really going to matter. Like th that, that's the nuance, I think, that we, we, we lack at this point. We still, and maybe the next, the next wave of, 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 of nuance and detail as we start to move further down this ESG path and think about embedded carbon. You know, what does it really cost from a broader life cycle standpoint to just tear that building down and build it all again? I mean, it would be great if every building were brand new and perfect and, and, and bream excellent. But the reality that we're, we're working with is much, much different. And we have to try to figure out a way to balance that functionality and, and carbon neutrality at the same time. Okay, great. I, I want to make sure that everybody has time to get to their next appointment, it being MIPIM, so finish within the, within the space. So a quick final question, which is, I suppose, um, in terms of the in investment side, um, what ticks your boxes, what are you interested in, um, and where are the opportunities, either regions or could be, is it more <clears throat> kind of big box, is it last mile? Um, and uh, let, let's start with you, Rob. Where should I be investing? Where should you be investing? Uh, well, we're, we're right across Europe, so we are looking at pretty much all the different risk profiles, to be honest. So we're not just in one area. Um, we do still like development. We are concerned about build costs, where we are the developer and not the uh, where we're doing it directly, which we are doing in Italy, for example. Um, but it is really just getting into the, these markets where there's rental growth and where we can really you know, drive those, those opportunities. You know, we're not really an investor that sits on 15-year um, income with indexation where you can't capture that. Yeah, great for some core buyers, but that's not for us. You know, we, we are an active manager. We want to be able to create that value, um, whether it's through repositioning or through you know, some of those capturing that growth or developing product. Great. Daniel? I think that generally the markets are pretty attractive, and I think if you... If you can find the right opportunity for your risk profile or capital, whether you're a core buyer or a value-add buyer, you know, there are opportunities there. Um, so we've been focused on the UK, but we're looking to move more into Europe now. And I think there are 
there are the right, there, there are opportunities across the sector, whatever your risk profile is. If you just you know spend the time and pick the right building. Great, Logan. Yeah, we're we're active pretty much everywhere in Europe. I think one type of investment that we've done well and and we've been good at are are the messy infill medium to long term roll up your sleeve redevelopment deals where you it's a it's a it's a short term sale lease back and it's just a spectacular location and you know the office tenant's going to leave and you buy the site next door and you redevelop it you know we're doing something just south of Barajas airport of Madrid along these lines um, we've got a a project just south of of uh, of Warsaw Ross Mile location great transportation fantastic power you know it's a a 1960s era communist television production plant, 160,000 square meter land. I mean, it's it's one of the most beautiful sites you'll see in in in, in Warsaw. Um, it it's a labor of love. These are it's not it's not a you know a, a three month project for sure. But given the the scale of the teams we have locally and the in the relationships, um, we feel that we're particularly good at, at projects like these that really really will have an impact on the on the cities and the urban environments they're in over the longer term. Great, thank you. Frank? I think it always helps when you know what you're doing. So we are specializing on logistics only, and uh, we cover most parts of continental Europe, and we do see opportunities everywhere. So we do do both. We do developments of different product types. We do acquisitions, both big pan-European portfolios or small portfolios or individual assets in countries. And you have to adapt to the, the to the different situations, and and of course it's helpful if you have teams on the ground, and 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 then you can approach it from different points. But generally speaking, all the market is attractive for those who understand the markets and the product. Great, thank you, um, and that takes us nicely to the to the end of our time here. Thanks very much for joining us on the live stream. Um, we'll be focusing um, later on today on uh, student housing. Um, but also then we'll be looking at logistics in terms of some of the kind of key market drivers um, that are that are leading into this kind of investment focus, really. So looking at the, the outlook and the key drivers globally around, around this particular topic. Um, so do feel free to join us for, for any of those. The logistics one is in the, in the Palais in Auditorium A, which is on the third floor. Um, but thanks very much for, for joining us. Really interesting conversation and great to be back in person with people and the fact that we can then show our appreciation for both you for being here and our speakers by giving them a round of applause. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.